God bless you. Let's stand together, please. And what shall we say to one another? Something good is going to happen to you. Would you turn and shake somebody's hand and say that? Something good is going to happen to you. Now may we touch someone or take their hand and have a word of prayer. Our Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit will do his mighty work through us tonight, that we may communicate the gospel of Jesus of Nazareth and receive it into our hearts and shall use it as an instrument of your love to demonstrate our love to humanity. God bless everyone here with a need and may that need be met and may your healing love flow among us. For Jesus' sake we pray, we believe, and we expect many miracles. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, and be seated. Would you turn in your Bible to St. John 10, 10? St. John 10, 10. These are the words of Jesus where he said, The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and have it more abundantly. Tonight's talk is on a celebration of life. There is an old legend of creation which I should like to relate to you today. It seems that all of the tiny seeds came up before God and he asked them to choose what they would like to become. One of them said, that there's more water on the surface of the earth than land, so I would like to be given fins so I can spend my life in the water. So God made that seed a fish. Another seed said, well, there's more air than there is land or water, so I would like to be given wings. And God made that seed a bird. Another tiny seed came up to God and said, I want to live on land, so I'd like sharp teeth and claws so I can eat food and defend myself. And God made that seed a lion, and so on. But there's one little seed that was almost forgotten. Finally, God said to that seed, what would you like to become? And this seed said, God, I don't want fins or wings or fangs. I don't want any of those things. I want to walk and talk with God. I want to build and create as God does. I want to be made in the image and likeness of God. And God made that seed a man. Now that's an old legend. In the Bible, we are told a more positive story, that God created man, and he created him his masterpiece. First, God created man and gave him the gifts of life. I want to enumerate several of those gifts that God gave to man. First of all, God gave man the power of communication. It is said that God made man's body from the dust of the ground, but he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. He came alive. And in the words used to describe God's creation of man, there is the suggestion that when God had finished creating man, and man realized that he was a creation of God, that he looked up into the face of God and smiled and said, Hello, God. And that God, when he looked down and saw his masterpiece, that he had created something that had never existed, someone different from all the other living things, that he smiled back and said, Hello, man. 
And the hello God and hello man rang throughout man's existence. It was the exuberance of the Creator looking at His creation and the created responding to His Creator. Another gift that God gave man was the power to walk and talk with God in a togetherness, in a home called Eden. In this home of Eden, God and man walked and talked together. There was a naturalness about it. There was no alienation or separation or loneliness. There was no deception or phoniness. They walked together in a naturalness that is as natural as our breathing is. And they talked and they walked. And it became a togetherness. Now it's this togetherness that is at the heart of the success of every human life. It's at the heart of the success of every marriage. It's at the heart of the success of every family of parents and children. It's at the heart of every success we have as living together as brothers, as sisters, of loving our neighbor as ourself. It is this ability to talk and walk together. It is not a talking that goes off on a tangent. It is not a walking wherein we go astray from God or from one another. But it is a talking and walking that produces a togetherness so that we achieve a unity. St. Paul speaks of it in our New Testament as the unity of the body of Christ. It is what St. Paul was referring to when he said that we live and move and have our being in God. And all men are created of the same blood. That there is no essential difference in men regarding race or color or nationality, or things of that nature, the togetherness, if we will accept it, is built into us by the creative love and act of God. God gave man an endowment of power over everything he had created, including the earth. He said, take dominion over it. Subdue the earth. And there's the beginning of science. And there's our rationale for treating our earth reverently, for cleaning up our earth, not only for God's own glory, but for our health, our welfare, and that it may produce, and we might be able to feed and clothe ourselves and other people who need to be fed and clothed. And he gave man this powerful intellect so that he was able to name every living thing. And someone has suggested that there were over 700,000 living things that Adam gave a name to. Can you imagine this intellect of Adam being as great because it was an extension of the intellect of God? God gave him an endowment of power, power to build, power to create, power to reproduce, power to replenish the earth and multiply himself. And then he gave him the great gift of the power of choice. And in making him a person of the power of choice, he is absolutely unique in all of God's creation. This power of choice was given to man that he might choose the path he would walk, that he might look upon life and decide which part of it he was going to accept or reject. Would he walk and talk with God since God had made him that way? Or would he decide to reject God and walk and talk in his going astray? Would he reproduce and multiply in the way that God had made him in a togetherness in a unity and love, 
Or would he become a selfish creature taking care of his own but denying the being and existence of someone else? This was a risk of God's faith. This was God believing in man. This is God's faith in a human being. Now that's the greatest faith that's ever been known. When people say to me, I have trouble having faith in God, I always reply, if you find it difficult having faith in God, think of the difficulty God has in having faith in you or me. God makes the greatest risk of all when he gives us the power of choice. For then, we can do with his creation what we will. We can pollute it or cleanse it. We can be reverent toward God or irreverent toward our Maker. We can be reverent toward one another or irreverent. We can uphold the living God or smash the very image of God in our own spirit. And God risked everything to give man the power of choice. You have it. I have it. You're using it. I'm using it this moment. And we do every moment of our existence. And God believes in you. God believes in me. God not only loves you, he believes in you. Then there was a discordant note in the Garden of Eden. Satan came. Jesus describes the devil as a thief. And in St. John 10, 10, he said, The thief, or the devil, cometh not but for to steal and kill and destroy. The devil came in the form of a serpent. And through the serpent, he spoke to man at a critical part of the way God had created him. In giving man the power of choice, God placed many trees in the garden, but separated one and said, you cannot eat of the fruit of that tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for if you do, in the day that you eat of it, you will die. There are many other trees, such as the tree of life, but that was not excluded. Only the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For up to this point, man is immortal. He is innocent. In his innocence and immortality, he is like a little child. A little child doesn't know that it is mortal. It doesn't know it can get sick. It doesn't know it's going to die. Only as it grows older and comes to grip with life as it is, does he see that this life is a mortal life and mortality will overtake each and every one of us. But the Bible says it's appointed unto man wants to die. Up till then, man had not died. He was immortal. Death was not in the original plan of God. Life was. As Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You see, the original purpose of God was to give life. The hello man and hello God was a celebration of life. It was a celebration of the life that is in God himself. Health, strength, intellectual ability, spiritual discernment, an intellect that can grasp whatever is in this universe, a spirit that can comprehend God and that can translate to the mind, the ability that it has to comprehend God. A being that can comprehend the depth of the riches of the love of God. All of that life was poured into man. And God intended that man should always be immortal. And he intends that man shall become immortal again. Because when our Lord returns, he shall translate the living who believe in Christ and shall resurrect the dead who have died in Christ. And uh, death will be swallowed up in victory. Mortality shall be overcome by immortality. And this corruptible flesh, this flesh that will die, will be taken up into incorruptibility. We will become a new Adam, even in our physical bodies, for then we will lose our present mortality. Well, how did he lose his mortality? He lost it because he believed the devil. He believed the lie. 
The devil says that God is lying to you. The devil says that if you eat of this tree, you won't die. God says you will die, but I say you won't die. Let me point out to you several things about the devil that he did not do on this occasion. The devil did not deny the existence of God. He did not deny that God had created man. He did not deny the immortality of man. He did not deny the power of God. He did not deny the life of God. He did not deny the tree of life. He did not deny that man has the power of choice. The Bible says that the devils believe and tremble. Only man has become a disbeliever. Satan knows. He knows. But because he rebelled in his heart against God and was cast out of heaven and uh, lost his original estate of beauty and perfection before God and became the devil, he sought to find a way to strike back at God. Since he could not become God himself, he now seeks to be God through a man, through the creation of man. If he can possess a human being and get him to do his will and way, then he still can be God. If you read Isaiah and Ezekiel, their prophecies will graphically portray to you how this archangel, Lucifer, one of the three archangels, decided that he would ascend above even the throne of God. He would take over. And God saw the sin in his spirit and cast him out. And he was cast to the earth. In St. Luke, Jesus himself says, I saw the devil fall as lightning out of heaven. And the devil lost his celestial light. He lost his heavenly body. He became a disembodied spirit. Something like a third of the angels followed him in this transgression and also fell from their first estate, losing their spiritual illumination, their celestial bodies. And now they seek human embodiment. The only power that Satan can really have is when he possesses or occupies a human life because it is through a man, God's masterpiece, that the devil can strive again to be God and can strike at God. Remember this, that the struggle over your life is between God and the devil. Your battle is not with flesh and blood, St. Paul says in Ephesians 6, for we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and the kingdoms of the darkness of this world. Therefore put on the whole armor of God. You see, the struggle over your life is not between human beings. It's between the devil and God. God created you and is trying to save you The devil tried to usurp the authority of God, to dislodge him as God, to become God. And now the only way he can strike at God is through God's masterpiece, which is man. It is true that man lost his first estate. He fell in transgression and sin and is no longer God's masterpiece, but he is God's material. And this statement is very enlightening if we'll only grasp it. We all know we are no longer God's masterpiece. I know that I'm not. You know that you're not. You feel your mortality. You see it cropping up every day in weakness, in body, mind, spirit, in the way you relate to God, the way you relate to people. Your mortality is in every funeral procession. It's in every hospital bed. It's in every discordant note that you would say to someone or they would say to you, Your mortality is everywhere. But God has not left it like that. While man is no longer God's masterpiece, he still is God's sacred material. And God is working with that material. He is trying to create a new man. Well, the devil tried to get man to disbelieve God. He was saying, in effect, that God has on 
a false image. God isn't what you think he is. He was saying that man had been given a false image. He was really not what God said he was. But if he would follow the devil, if he would eat of this tree of knowledge, he would be a god. And so Eve was deceived first and then led Adam into it and he accepted the deception and was just as much deceived as she was. And when they ate of it, suddenly their eyes were open. That is to say, the whole mortality of their being was exposed to themselves. It was so frightening and so different from the way God had created them and where he had placed them in a home of togetherness with an endowment of power and the power of choice. It was so different from that that man hid. He even tried to hide from God. He covered up himself. He closed his inner man because he became frightened. He became frightened in the presence of potential death. He became frightened in the presence of being a limited person, of being mortal. He saw that he was now futile in his existence. He had lost something and he seemed irretrievable. So he was afraid and hid himself. God came wondering where he was, where art thou Adam? And he said, I'm here. I hid myself because I ate of the tree. His intellect was placed upon a pedestal. It took over his life. His spirit or his soul was put down. And in the suppression of his spirit was the death of his spirit. And suddenly he was on the level of the five senses. He was no longer on the level that God created us, the supernatural level, where we are immortal. But he was on the level of taste and feel and smell and seeing and hearing. He's on the ordinary human physical level. There he was. And Satan had deceived him. You see the beginning? Hello, God. Hello, man. Do you see the ending? Do you see the funeral processions? Do you hear the funeral dirges? Do you hear the melancholy music in the soul of man? The poet wrote these two lines that really express what happened back there. Mr. William Henley wrote Invictus, and it's considered one of the greatest poems of all time. But in it is a real revelation of what happened when man was responding to the devil and was rejecting God. The two last lines, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And it is said that Mr. William Henley would recite those two last lines when he became drunk. In his drunkenness, he would mumble those words, I am the master of my own fate. I am the captain of my own soul. If you can picture in your mind a drunken, stumbling man, a wreck of a human being who has been able to reach down deep inside himself and touch again some of the splendor of his creation and bring forth a poem as great as Invictus, and now, with slurred speech, he sees that man has lost it, that man is really trying to become God, that he wants to be the big boss. I'm going to do it my way. And with stumbling words, he says, I am the master of my own fate. I am the captain of my own soul. They're hollow words in the spirit of man everywhere tonight. And wherever any of us are, individuals, or families, or groups, and we have this irreverence toward God to the extent that we think we can do it. I can take care of myself. I know how far to go. Then we're doing exactly what Satan 
deceived man into doing in the beginning and what caused him to lose what God had made him to be. And then God sent a new Adam. God came down and became a man, a human being like he first made. And this second Adam had the same gift of communication where he could walk and talk with God. The second Adam is Jesus Christ. And uh, as man, he was able to communicate. As the second Adam, he could talk with God. Also, on this earth, he could walk with God in a togetherness. He would be heard to say, my father and I are one. He would say, Father. God was never called Father in the Old Testament. He was never called Father until Jesus, the second Adam, came. This is a very important point. God's name in the Old Testament really meant I am. But in the New Testament, Jesus introduced a new word to describe God, Father. And it was in the most endearing terms, Father, or as you might say, Daddy, or as I called my father, Papa. Jesus introduced a new kind of nearness, new to us, but not new to Adam and Eve, and not new to the second Adam. He introduced us to God by giving him a new name, Father. When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven. Or my Father, he would say. My Father revealed this. Jesus was able to talk with God. The second Adam had nothing to cover up. There was no sin that the second Adam wanted to commit. He could say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, because the second Adam was living that then. He was then what he was before he was made man, and what he would be after he no longer was mortal, but would be raised from the dead and glorified and sat down at God's right hand again. And there's an opposite to that, and it's hell. It's being a sinner and going to hell so that people would say, why would a merciful God send any human being to hell? He doesn't. The Bible says that hell was made for the devil and his angel. It was never made for man. It was never a place conceived in the mind of God that man would go to. It was made for the devil and his angels. And a man, when his body dies, will only go to hell because he has already lived what hell is in his heart, has accepted it as a way of life, and will never change. A sinner who goes to hell is different from a sinner who turns to God. A sinner who turns to God changes his mind about his way of life. A sinner who turns to God rejects the thoughts which have been negative in his life. He rejects the unbelief he has had in God. He changes and desires in his heart a transformation, a change, that he might become a new creature. But a sinner going to hell doesn't desire that change. He's already practicing the spirit that he will be practicing when he is in hell. He would be out of place in heaven. He would hate heaven. He would want to be out of heaven because heaven would be hell. So there's the opposite of what God was coming to do through the second Adam, Jesus Christ, which was to bring a new name of God, Father, Father. And thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, 
When you're converted or saved by Jesus Christ, you become a Christian, but you don't necessarily become a disciple of Jesus. A disciple is a follower and learner. You can be converted from your sins and saved by the grace of God in a moment. God can actually miraculously give you that kind of conversion and turn your life around. But in order for you to become a disciple of Jesus Christ, you have to follow him, learn of him. He said, if any man would be my disciple, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. He's not talking about an instant of salvation. He's talking about day by day by day by day so that he would say, he that endure to the end the same shall be saved. If it fades away, you've never become a disciple. You've accepted what God has done for you through the forgiveness of your sins and giving you a new nature, but you have never accepted the fact that you're going to do something for him. Even in the Garden of Eden, God told man to dress the garden, to work. There was no permissiveness, whatever. He was living under the authority and the discipline of God. And to be a disciple, one must accept a discipline. You see, the original rule of God on the earth was a theocracy. It was God ruling from above. And he said it's better to obey than to sacrifice. When anything is compulsory, most human beings reject it. This goes all the way back to what the devil was trying to do through man to get him to reject the authority of God because Lucifer became the devil for the simple reason he rejected the authority of God. He usurped that authority. He wanted that authority for himself. So Jesus confirmed this in Matthew 8 when the Roman captain came for the healing of his servant. And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. And the man said, oh, no, it's not necessary for you to come in order to heal him because I'm a man under authority myself and I know what authority is. You have such authority, it's above all authority. All you have to do is say the word and the disease will leave my service body. Jesus was indicating here that we must accept authority and give authority. As we give authority, we accept authority. But we must accept the authority of God over our lives. And when you reach the state of discipleship, where that you're following Jesus, you learn that when he asks something of you, that he has a blessing to give you. When he demands something, in it is the gift of life itself. It is a compulsory demand based upon God's love for us and his belief in us. Well, now, the second Adam had the power of communication with God. He had this togetherness with God and with man. And he had the endowment of power. When the Holy Spirit came upon him, he went in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And the great miracles began to take place. He too had the power of choice. And he faced the power of choice in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was having to decide whether he would obey or disobey God. The devil had come to him the same as he had the first Adam and offered him a compromise. There in the three temptations, one of them was, if you bow down before me and worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He knew what Christ wanted, and he tempted him at that vulnerable point. But Christ rejected that. It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. But here in the Garden of Gethsemane, in the last few hours of his life, he too is tested. Tested by the devil. Tested in his power of choice. It was hard. And it's hard today to say no to the devil. It's hard because we are mortal. It's hard because we want permissiveness. We don't want authority. But I'm glad that Jesus' humanity shone in the Garden of Gethsemane. He didn't want it either. It was hard for him to say yes to God and no to the devil. And it was so hard that he sweated, and the sweat became bloody. And finally he said, 
Not my will, but thine be done. It was clearly not his own personal will. It was clearly the acceptance of God's higher will to go to the cross. And he only went because he knew that God would raise him from the dead. I don't believe anybody can plant a seed of faith. A seed of love, a seed of giving, a seed of doing something worthwhile in this world without knowing that that seed will come back in some way. That's the lesser form of the resurrection coming back. Jesus putting the seed of his life on the cross, he knew it would be multiplied back to him in the resurrection. And that was a joy set before him. Jesus talked a lot to people about thirsting and hungering. He said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And if you believe on me, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water, which spake ye of the Holy Spirit, which had not yet been given, but that they who believe on him should receive after he was glorified. He frankly stated that he is the second Adam coming down in the human form was not enough. That that human form could not remain on earth. That he had to send the Holy Spirit. Now then we get into the very heart of what this whole course is about. Of walking and talking with God. 1 Corinthians 14 and 15. St. Paul says, I will pray with my spirit and I'll pray with my understanding also. Paul is saying what he would speak with his spirit would also become what he would speak with his understanding. God is showing us that there is a difference between our spirit and our understanding, our intellect. Way back in the Garden of Eden, it shows that when man rebelled and sinned, he was repressing and suppressing the spiritual part of him. That part of him was no longer functioning as God had created it. He had elevated his intellect to the position of rulership over his life. He had rejected the authority of God over him. He was going his own way. And the moment it happened, his understanding was blurred. He couldn't grasp. Therefore, he hid himself. He was filled with inhibitions. He didn't know how to pray or what to pray for as he ought. And that's what's true today. There was that time in my life when I was so inhibited, so inwardly bound up that it was not natural for me to think about God. It was not natural for me to talk to God. There was a fear. There was a reserve. Now I could talk to my father, my mother, my brother, my sister. I could talk to people. I could talk to my teacher. But I couldn't talk to God. We say, will you lead in prayer? Oh, I cannot lead in prayer. If I were to say to you, would you run in this house and tell the man that the house is on fire? You could run in the house and say, say, mister, your house is on fire. But when we say, pray for someone, he's really in trouble. Oh, I don't know how to do that. The understanding of man has suffered a mortal blow by man's transgression. And now Jesus is saying that they that believe on me shall receive the Holy Spirit after I'm glorified, after I'm no longer in this human body, after I'm out of it and I'm back in my limitlessness, I will send the Holy Spirit and when the Holy Spirit comes, he will be in you. I am visible to you now, but God the Holy Spirit will be invisible. I am physical to you now, but he will not be physical. I am limited to this mortal flesh now, but the Holy Spirit will not be limited to mortal flesh. And when the Holy Spirit comes... He will teach you whatsoever I have said unto you. And then Paul further explains in Romans 8, 26, 27, we know not what we should pray for as we ought, 
but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. For the mind of the Spirit searcheth the heart, searcheth the spirit of man, and he knows what the mind of the Spirit is, and he prays for us according to the will of God. Now connect that with 1 Corinthians 14, 14. Paul says, when I pray in tongues, my spirit prayeth. What will I do then? He says, I'll pray with my spirit, then I'll pray with my understanding also. Listen carefully. He's saying, what I am saying with my spirit will become what I'm saying with my understanding. The opening up of my spirit will open up my understanding. The word will become flesh. The word that I say in tongues will become a word of my understanding. For the word that I say in tongues is being said by my spirit, which has been renewed by the Holy Spirit. Next, they become words of my understanding. And that which is spirit becomes flesh. Just as God became flesh, God is the Word. God became the Word, and the Word was flesh. So that through the Holy Spirit, what we feel and express toward God with our spirit, we then can feel and express toward God with our understanding. We lose those inhibitions and fears. We get into a freedom, if we will. Now, just as I had an uncle once upon whose farm they struck oil and gave him thousands and thousands of dollars, he bought the most expensive car that could be bought uh, at that time when I was a little boy and never learned to drive it. So one can be filled with the Holy Spirit and pray with his spirit in tongues and never really know what he has and receive very little benefit from it because he doesn't make the word come flesh. He doesn't make what is in the spirit come alive in his understanding. I'll never be thankful enough to one of our associates here on campus, Mr. Jack Wallace, who stood up the other night and said so much better than the way I've been trying to say it that when he opened up and accepted the prayer language of the Spirit and began to pray in tongues that suddenly his mind opened up and he could pray with his understanding. Ideas began to come and prayers began to come and a freedom began to come. That's what it's all about. Because God made us rational creatures. He made us to understand and comprehend God. He made us to take dominion over this earth and subdue it. He made us to have a togetherness with him and with one another. He made us not to be inhibited, closed off, shut up from one another, but open toward God and open to each other. He made us to love one another. Let me bring it to a close by bringing what I think is the most important thing of all. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 13 and we'll see what it means to walk in the Spirit. Jesus talked and walked with God in a togetherness. And this is what God has enabled us to do today, to talk and walk with him. That is, to pray with our spirit and to pray with our understanding to think with our spirit, to think with our understanding, to talk and to walk and to get into love. It's so important to talk. You get flowers or a box of candy, you're anxious to find the card and know the name of the giver and a little personal word they may have written. You say, if you can't come, phone me or write me. It's so wonderful to talk. It's so important in marriage to say I do. It's so important to talk in the spirit, to talk in the new language, the prayer language of your spirit. It's so important to you, but it's important also to walk, to walk in the spirit. And that's the walk of love. Have you opened it to 1 Corinthians 13? Let's read out loud together. Ready? 
Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Say it again. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Read the last line. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And God says, hello with love. Will you stand, please? Hello, God. <laughs> Hello, man. <laughs> Hello, darling. Hello, wife. Hello, husband. Hello, sweetheart. Hello. I'm afraid to ask you if I did a good job. You might tell me the truth. <laughs> <laughs> you want the truth? Yes. You did a great job. Oh, darling. <laughs> oh, thank you. You know, I'd really like to begin at the end instead of the beginning tonight. Because that, it's that so That sounds beautiful. like a woman, all right. Yeah. You said something tonight that you either had never said before or else it's just now getting through this thick head of mine. I don't know which. You were reading the scripture where Paul said, I will pray with my spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. And then you gave the difference between our spirit and our intellect and how it all began to disintegrate in the Garden of Eden. But then when you got over here, you said that man not only suppressed his spirit, but also his understanding was blurred. And that finally got through to me tonight. And you may have said it that way Seven before, times but it never got came through. tonight. I've been saying that, haven't I? But did he say it just like that? I've never heard him say the understanding had been blurred. No, they're going to agree with you, honey. I, <laughs> so I accept that. But it's true. His understanding was blurred, even though he tried to elevate it. Well, St. Paul said we see through a glass darkly. And it all happened because of the mortality, which we have because of Satan in the Garden of Eden, that we don't understand things. It's no wonder that I'm so thick-headed. I have to have the Holy Spirit to help me to understand things. Don't we all have to have the Holy Spirit to help us understand things that we don't understand? Evelyn, I think it's terribly important that we understand when Christ saves our souls, the Holy Spirit as a person comes in. In fact, it is the Holy Spirit who convicts us of our sins. Yes. It is the Holy Spirit that gives us this newness of life. And he comes in like a river of living water. He's there. If I could say one thing above everything else in the world, I would say this to a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit. Yes. But you must release the Holy Spirit. You must release the prayer language of the Spirit. You must open up and let your spirit start talking so that what you say with your spirit becomes what you say with your understanding and the Word becomes flesh. Oh, and that was a beautiful thought, that when Jesus came to earth, the Word that we had heard about before, which was Jesus, became flesh. He came down and became flesh. But I'd never seen it exactly like this, that actually the Holy Spirit makes the Word become flesh in us. All right. How was Jesus Christ conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary? By whom? By the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. All right, who came upon Jesus at the River Jordan 
when John was baptizing him in the water. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. All right. Where did Jesus receive his power for all the miracles that he did? From the Holy Spirit. From the Holy Spirit. (laughs) You see, he said without the Spirit, he did nothing. Without the Father, he did nothing. He was dependent upon the Holy Spirit. And he, he said, it's better for you that I go away so I can send the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit will be in you. Don't you see that the human Jesus couldn't come inside? He couldn't come in you. Only his spirit could come in you. Mm, yeah. you, you see, as long as Christ was in the flesh, they could crucify him. But you can't crucify the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in you. Right. Jesus said, I've been with you a little while. The Holy Spirit will be with you forever. Now you get me to preaching again. This is really a great crowd. Yes, it is. That thought was just so wonderful because you said, too, that the Bible says that when the Holy Spirit comes, doesn't it say he will show you all things? Whatsoever I have said unto you. The only way you will ever know God is through the Holy Spirit because only he can make God relevant, related to us in the now, because the Holy Spirit is God in every man's now. Oh, say that again now. The Holy Spirit is God in every man's now. That's great. You see, Jesus was the human part 2,000 years ago. He's not that today. The human man, as he was then, doesn't walk on this earth. But God, the Holy Spirit, walks on this earth because he is God in every man's now. The only way God can be in the now of every man, of every age, is in the Holy Spirit. Mm. 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 And the Holy Spirit is the only one who can reveal Jesus to you. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will testify of me. If you want to know Christ, receive the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit have his way, and he will be like an artist. He will paint the picture, but he will go beyond an artist. He will sculpture Jesus. He'll go beyond the sculpture and he'll just bring him out in the spirit right to you, inside you. And you'll think his thoughts and you'll say his words. The word will become flesh in you. Well, I know he knew that the disciples would not understand what he was trying to teach them. Same way we wouldn't understand. That's right. Because man's in his mortality. The only escape from any part of our mortality is through the Holy Spirit. God is determined that the Holy Spirit is going to become real to millions of people. Yes, I really believe that. And I want to thank God for the old-time Pentecostal people who held on to the Holy Spirit when the going was rough. And And now they're reaping a lot of benefits. They are. But the beautiful part is that they made a contribution. And now the other denominations and churches are realizing more of the Holy Spirit. It's not that they never had the Holy Spirit or completely denied the Holy Spirit. It's not at all. Somehow there was a failure to grasp, to understand. But now there's coming a glory in the church. I see it. People are hungry for more of the Holy Spirit. We're getting a togetherness about us. And that's what God is all about. He wants to be together with you and me. He wants us to get it together. And really the Holy Spirit is the only thing that will break down the barriers and put us together. He is not a thing. He is a person, I beg your pardon. What I intended to say was that the person of the Holy Spirit in us is what breaks down the barriers between between us. us, Between us and lets us see one another with our understanding. Look, if you understood the person that you're having trouble with, if you really understood him, you probably wouldn't feel bad toward him. Many times you will say, oh, I understand. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I see. You see, the understanding brings a unity And here, St. Paul is talking about praying with the Spirit so you can pray with your understanding. He's telling you that if we'll get in the Spirit with one another, our understanding will happen and we can feel each other better. 
I'm not saying it like I want to say it. Yes, you are. It really makes sense because, you see, God has mercy on us because he looks down on the inside and he sees what's in there. He understands. He understands. But when our communication breaks down between us, then we can't understand each other and therefore we have bad feelings toward each we other. We don't speak the same language. Right. Hold it. See? Right there. When God made man, there was only one language. There was never a breaking up of languages until the Tower of Babel, which is described in the book of Genesis. When man was building a tower, he was going to try to build it clear to heaven and take over God's throne again. And God said whatever he imagines he can do, he can do, and he came down and confused their language. And suddenly there were all these different languages and they couldn't understand each other and they couldn't build it anymore. Do you remember that? Oh, I do, yes. But when you pray with the Spirit, you're praying in the same language because it's the Holy Spirit's language. It may be a different language as far as your ear is concerned. Yes. But the Holy Spirit's language is always the same language, although it may sound differently to the ear. That's beautiful. You know, I'd really like to hear someone from the theology department given something. Dr. Fair, I see you going. Thank you. President Roberts, I'd like to move back to a question on Adam, where you started. Later on, you mentioned that man was reduced to five senses. And I wanted to ask, do you believe that Adam had singular powers, unusual powers, at which we can scarcely guess? That is, is it possible that in his mental, physical, and spiritual capabilities, he was far superior to anything we can even imagine? Yes, I think the only way you can grasp it is to see what Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration when the glory shone through. So his face and his clothes shone above the brightness of the sun. I believe that Adam was so superior, he was, in essence, a literal extension of God. And his intellect understood, his body had superior powers, his spirit was flawless. Well, he walked and talked with God. This sixth sense we often speak of as being present in man must have been tremendously developed in Adam, and I wondered if you'd had any thoughts on that. I believe that in every human being there is something left of Adam. There are flashes of it, and it's in almost every field of endeavor. There's a flash when a person can see. There's a flash when a person can create, whether he's a Christian or not a Christian. What I've been trying to say is, if the Christians will be filled with the Spirit, and if they will pray with their spirit until what they say in their spirit becomes the same in their understanding, we can bring forth flashes of this not intermittently, but constantly on this earth. This university is a flash of inspiration, but it must not remain a flash. It's got to be a fire that endures. That was going to lead to my next yeah. question, which was, isn't it true that many times you know things in the spirit long before your understanding catches up to what that significance really is. I'm sure it's true of you and all other Christians, sometimes five and ten years. I knew 20 years before we ever built the university that I had to build it, that it was coming. I knew it as much as I know it now. But you're the same. You know things now in your spirit that'll happen five years from now, ten years from now. Have you any hints on how we could develop this spiritual feel for realities which haven't yet appeared? I have two suggestions, Dr. Farrow, and they're suggestions that I try to follow. However well I do them is a question, but I try to follow them. First is to talk in the Spirit and with the Spirit, so that what I say with my spirit now become what I say with my understanding. Now I try to do that in that I pray in tongues many times a day, and I pray in English many times a day. I'm trying to say in my understanding what I've said in tongues. The second thing is this idea of walking with God, the walk of togetherness, of being part of the other man, of feeling a concern for him, 
praying one for another that we might be healed. As I enter into your needs, something good's going to happen to me. The prayer in St. James 5, 16, pray ye one for another that ye may be healed, is a promise to the one that's doing the praying for the other person. It's a promise to the one praying that ye may be healed. Now, that's the form to me of walking with God in a togetherness of being a disciple, a learner, a follower. Now, those are the two suggestions I would make. What do you think about them? Well, I think they're excellent. I think that in my own life, you know, using the Spirit over a period of years, there's knowledge that comes of realities that aren't here at all, yet you know just positively those realities are going to exist. And I think that Prayer in the Spirit brings us much more in tune with what God is going to do and that that gives us a clarification in our own spirits. I think we can exercise our spirits so that they are able to apprehend that which is ahead of us. That's a great point, Dr. Farah. And beginning next Tuesday night in this session, I'm going to start at the point you're talking about. I've been building the foundation from Genesis and the creation of man, his fall and restoration of the second Adam, for a purpose. I'm going to take Acts 2, Acts 8, and 9, Acts 10, Acts 19. And we're going to talk about a timing that people had in receiving this gift of the Holy Spirit, this prayer language of the Spirit. We're going to get down into the practical side to where people here who might say, what must I do to have this? We're going to talk about that how to do it because I know what you're saying is true thank you All right. is there someone else who would like to step up to the mic I'd like to carry out just a little bit here this matter of the blurred understanding when Adam made his declaration of independence from God and sinned his understanding was blurred yes sir he couldn't think God's thoughts he couldn't live on this level that he'd known before So here's the beautiful thing that Paul said, when I pray in tongues, my spirit prays, my mind is unfruitful. That is, you can pray pure prayer in the spirit without having it cluttered up by the understanding because we don't think God's thoughts. We are in direct communion with God in the spirit. And to me, that's a terrific thing. Then when you add the second dimension to it. Right. Then there comes the lifted understanding. Praying with the understanding. Right. Next, that is to say with your intellect. It's the most powerful thing I know. If a person will understand what it is. You remember I said you can have all of this. But if we don't apply it, it's worthless. Okay, that brings me to the next thing I wish you'd expand on just a little bit. Is it possible for a person to be totally submissive to God and yet not avail himself of all of these spiritual blessings that God has in store for him? My wife says it it is. I think, yes, I think because of our limited understanding, unless we get an understanding from God, we will not receive from him I think it's possible to be really submissive to God but not know how to accept it or how to receive what comes from God. I think what she's saying, or at least she's saying it to me, you can be submissive to God and yet not have the understanding that goes along with it. In other words, a person really loves the Lord, wants to do God's will, but that doesn't mean he understands. I think the understanding is right at the top. It's at the peak. Paul is saying he prays with the Spirit that he might be able to pray with the understanding. We can't make tongues an end in itself or anything else an end in itself. God said, with all you're getting, get understanding. And if a person has an open heart searching after God, God is going to lead that person into more spiritual reality. Not if the person doesn't understand that what God is leading him into is what he should have. My experience with people is they can be led right up to it, and if they don't make an effort, it never happens. Uh, Most of the time, you'll never pray with tongues until you shut your mind and start speaking. That's it. That's it. 
you shut your mind and open your mouth. <laughs> so uh, you've answered the question then, the original question. Yes, it is possible for a person to give all but not receive all. Yes, that's true. It is right. possible. Right. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Who is next? Dr. Voigt. It isn't fair, President Roberts, to have an old-time Pentecostal around because, you know, I it's get about fair. ten sermons that I'd like to <laughs> start it's very with. Fair, Dr. There's a beautiful history, I think, in what you're saying about understanding. In the early days of my own Christian experience, we were taught that when you prayed in the Spirit, you prayed through and you felt better. You knew that something good had happened. Then in the first ministerial seminar that you had here, you spoke on the therapeutic value of tongues. This one opened up a whole new avenue of understanding that it was a definite means by which a man could receive release from doubts or fears or sins that he wasn't conscious of. And then in this Holy Spirit class, we're getting a new dimension now that not only do we feel better when we speak in tongues, not only is it therapeutic in that we are recreated, but now then we can understand specifically what the problem was we were feeling better having been delivered from and what it was we were recreated for. <laughs> so, well, I can see that, can't you, Evelyn? That's great. Well, of course. <laughs> so the beautiful progression of it, how that the Holy Spirit is opening up, and to us then, or anyway to these young people, I think it's a tremendous thing that not only we had to pray in faith. Well, I was burdened, I prayed, I felt good, I prayed through, I felt better, goody, goody, God took care of it. <laughs> Then there came a time when I thought, no, there's something specific that God took care of. But now then I can actually pray and believe that God will help me to know the very thing it yes, was. Yes, sir. And then by faith I can accept that burden as being lifted, that problem as being solved. And so when we pray with the Spirit and the understanding, then by faith we ought to accept that God did that. And Dr. Voigt, you can go a further step with that. Once you're freed within and receive the therapeutic help of the Holy Spirit, mm. as you indicated. Your mind is free then to really understand life. Mm -hmm. it, it is a celebration of life. It helps you to understand God, people, things, helps you to be more creative because you're more free. I think that's a key point. I'm no longer bound. I don't have to fight the same battles over the same doubts all the time. You I don't get always, rid of those doubts. I don't always have to go through the same feeling of unworthiness or guilt or inability. But when I pray, I can understand God took care of that unworthiness. Forget it. I'm free to a new plateau, a new era in Christ. I think this is, if this we is actually great. do what you're saying, which God wants us to do, of mm -hmm. course, is to talk and walk with him, there's the potential of becoming a completed man, mm -hmm. a completed human being other than our own mortality, which mm -hmm. will be swallowed up in the resurrection. Mm -hmm. But there is a certain form of completeness in man that can be done in his mortality. Mm -hmm. And that is when he walks and talks with God, he prays with the Spirit and with his understanding. He's talking and walking with God. He understands what he's doing. I keep saying we must comprehend this. Mm -hmm. This opened up a whole new appreciation then for the second chapter of Hebrews. What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, crowned him with glory and honor, did set him over the work of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. This was the first Adam, complete, dominant, that's right. perfect. Then he said, but now, that's us, we see not all things put under us, but we see Jesus. And this has just thrilled me with, I see Jesus, therefore I see what God wants me to be in him. Read on there, oh, oh. Verse two. <laughs> for we see Jesus. What happened next, for we see Jesus? Mm -hmm. Who for the Here's suffering that you were speaking about, he was made a little lower than the angels yes. for the suffering of death, but now what? Mm -hmm. Where is he? Yes. He's exalted, of course, at the right hand of the Father. Above Father's. the angels. Mm -hmm. And so that in Christ we are not below the angels, we're mm -hmm. above the angels. Brought back. We're brought back in Christ to the place that we had in the first Adam. There's a great thought you brought out tonight, which is so beautiful, that literally helps our understanding, I think, is to have a discipline about our lives and to really come under the authority of God, which is difficult for any of us. 
Well, it's just hard for me to come under anybody's authority, and I guess it is anybody else's, you know. true. <laughs> I want to go my own way, and but really there's such a discipline that comes with this. I think I could understand a lot more about the Lord if I would really discipline myself. Amen. Now, I don't mean the kind of discipline you're talking, <laughs> not your discipline. Ah, now hold on. You students were asleep when she said that. Oh, you weren't? You, you were awake? Okay. Now we have a question. President Roberts, I've been very much edified by your statement, Hello, God. I've been thinking about that for the past week as you brought it forth last week. And I try to think of the intimacy of that word when Adam said, Hello, God. It seemed to be that Adam opened up his entire being when he said that, Hello, God. And he just opened up all the lines of communication between him and God. And then when God responded, Hello, Adam, he opened up all the communications from above to Adam. I thought that was a beautiful illustration. And the fact is that by the Holy Spirit, we can pray that intimate prayer, Hello, God. Mm. And God can reply back to us, Hello. And he opens up his channels to us that we might receive. But I think we're doing a big injustice if we stop there by just saying communication between us and God. I think if I really in the spirit say, hello, Mrs. Roberts, or hello, President Roberts, I can open up my entire self to you, all that I am. And by you responding in the spirit, hello, Gary, you open up yourself and we can minister and give to one another. And I think it's really... Uh, now, to me, thing. what you're saying, you're talking and walking. First, you're talking, hello, God. God is saying, hello, Jerry. And then we are walking with God. And to walk with God, we have to walk with our brother. Right. If we don't walk with our brother, we cannot walk with God. If we don't love our brother, we cannot love God. Right. The togetherness, I think, is what you're indicating. I think so many times we're afraid to really open up ourselves to our brothers and sisters, to really let them look in our lives and see the things that God has done in our lives. And we really need to do that to be intimate with each other. It's important. Amen. President Roberts, one of the most valuable things I've learned since I've been here is the fact that I should seek after praying with the understanding. And something in line with what Gary was talking about I think has been valuable to me in that sometimes we think that we pray in the spirit and then in that same moment we have to get that full understanding like what was brought about previously. But what I'm saying is so often we gain understanding in our communication with others and that understanding comes in the fellowship one with another as we belong to each other and as we belong to the Lord. So I thought that understanding comes not only to us individually but as we fellowship and grow into a deeper understanding, learning from each other and being part of each other. Thank you so much. Let us stand, please, and reach out to one another, and let us now pray one for another. And I'm going to ask if you have a need in your life, if you cannot touch someone else, touch yourself. And as we pray together and one for another, Try to pray for someone else. Don't worry about the miracle coming to you. You may get your miracle through praying for someone else. And let's pray one for another. Dear God, hello to you. Bless you. We reverence you. We honor you. We believe in you. And we know that you're in us. We pray now for our brother, our sister who has a need. And may God heal you. May God lift you up. May God help you with your problems. May you have a miracle from God in your life. And you will through Jesus Christ our Savior. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. We'll see you next Tuesday night on time at 7. Okay? Good night with love.